Okay, yeah, it looks like we're still getting people who are joining. So we'll give them a, mo a moment or two. I know the lighting is weird in this room, but can you hear me at least? Oh yeah. Okay, thanks. You look pretty good there, Bruce. You're pretty small though in the frame. Am I? <laughs> sure. I don't know if you want to move closer. I can't really. I'd be eating this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and did you test out slides if you have any? Yes. Great. I'm seeing some USC colleagues join. That's fantastic. Okay, let me just make sure I'm plugged in and we, maybe we'll get started. People will trickle in as they do. So I'd like to welcome everyone to our social Rangel Social Medicine Lecture Series in collaboration with the research theme at the UCLA School of Medicine in Translational Social Science and Health Equity. It's really my pleasure to introduce, and really a pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, on a personal note, this is someone who has been a Enorm enormous guiding light for me and so many other people <laughs> that attempt to do research and practice in this area. Uh, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of people here to say that Bruce is simply, Dr. Link is one of the most quietly insightful and at the same time loving and supportive um, and positive people that I've ever met. So whenever I need to have hope for the future, I reach out to Dr. Bruce Link. <laughs> He's a force of nature, uh, a, a still water that runs deep. Let me, let me put it that way. Um, and, and such just an encouraging and calming presence in every space that he's in. So I, I don't think that I would be where I am having not met Dr. Bruce Link. And I know that many other people share that feeling. So now to the more formal part of his background. Um, Bruce Link is Distinguished Professor of Public Policy and Sociology at the University of California, Riverside, um, and Professor Emeritus of Epidemiology and Sociomedical Sciences at Mailman School of Public Health of Columbia, which is where I met him. So he received his PhD in sociology in 1980 and a master's in biostatistics in 82 from Columbia, and has gone on to get a number, just innumerable awards after that, ranging from the Leonard Perlin Award for Career Achievement from the Mental Health Section of the American Sociological Association in 2002, and then 2007, the Leo Reeder Award from Medical Sociology Section of the American Sociological Association, and the Rima Lampus Award from the Mental Health Section of the American Public Health Association. He was elected to the US National Academy of Medicine in 2002. And um, I know that his theory of fundamental causes has been cited thousands and thousands of times around the world. So we're really honored to have Dr. Bruce Link talk about fundamental cause theory 
which dates back to 90, well, he'll, he'll refresh my memory on which year he and co-author and collaborator Joe Phelan um, introduced fundamental cause theory to the world. And we're going to, he'll tell us what we're hearing now in terms of new applications and new insights from fundamental cause theory. Cause theory. Thank you. Gee that's a, what a wonderful introduction. I don't think I've ever had a better one. And you know, you almost got me teared up here as I, as I, as I start out. And you said I was a calming water, um, but part of my goal was to stir us up. So we'll see what happens. Um, here's what I wanted to do today uh, is to talk about two papers really that I've been working on recently. Uh, Helena said I could review some about fundamental cause, but then also talk about some things that I'm doing right now. So I'm gonna talk about the current state of fundamental cause theory as it pertains to the connection between socioeconomic status and health first. And then I wanna just have a small application to thinking about the fundamental cause lens we might put on and thinking about COVID inequalities. And then I wanna talk about the um, the movement of fundamental cause theory to consider stigma and racism as fundamental causes. And then finally, I want to point out to us that when I talk about fundamental causes, uh, we're focusing on the actions of those who are propitiously located in racial and socioeconomic hierarchies. And we're thinking about them in our explanations of health inequalities. And the last thing I want to do is ask whether this focus is represented in the current canon of health inequalities research. And my point will be that it's not. And that's the part I'd like to stir us up about a little bit. Okay, so here we go. I'll try to talk fast. I'll try to engage my New Yorker, my inner New Yorker and, and talk fast. I hope I don't talk too fast, but I wanna have time to hear from you. I saw the names come up and I felt <laughs> intimidated at how many very famous people were in the audience. So. I'm very happy about that too. Thanks for, for all of you being there. Okay, here goes. Um, so fundamental cause theory begins with the observation that the connection between socioeconomic status, by that I'm thinking of education, occupation, income, and wealth, and health has been commonly observed across places and times. And this SES connection disease is present even when diseases and the relevant risk and protective factors change from place to place and time to time. And then the theory was constructed to explain why this would be so. A fundamental cause, the theory asserts, is a cause that is related to multiple disease outcomes, not just one, through multiple replaceable mechanisms. And then the idea that's really interesting about it, I think, is that the mechanisms are replaced in different places and times uh, so as to reproduce the fundamental relationship. So let me show you a diagram of this. And it's a simple diagram. The fundamental cause, the FC, and then the replaceable mechanisms. And the idea is that if a mechanism is blocked, so we have an association between the fundamental cause and the outcome uh, that we see there in the two red arrows, but then if one of them gets blocked, the idea is that the fundamental cause replaces that mechanism with a new one. And so you look at that and you just look at it in a diagram diagrammatic form and you say, well, how does that happen? Does it come some kind of diabolical ma magic? And also mention here that when we're, I like to use this as a fundamental cause is a cause of causal relationships. It causes the, the mechanisms to be replaced. So it's a, it's a cause of causal relationships. And I took that from Jeremy Fries and his colleague there. So we need an explanation. How can we think of a process that reliably creates causal mechanisms? So for SES, we're gonna think about something we're called flexible resources by individuals uh, and groups. And then racism and stigma, people use stigma to get something they want to keep others down in or away. So first with respect to SES and the flexible resources, we think of them as knowledge, money, power, prestige, and beneficial social connections. And they're flexible because they're broadly serviceable. They're useful across places and times. Doesn't matter what the risk factors are, doesn't matter what the diseases are, these flexible resources can get you in a better situation, health situation. So when a new risk factor emerges or a new protective factor is discovered, the use of flexible resources shapes who benefits and who's harmed. 
So I'm gonna talk about the emergence of COVID in a minute, but that's an example. Uh, or the discovery of a health beneficial cancer, cancer screen. It comes into being, being and it becomes a new mechanism linking socioeconomic status and, and, and a health outcome. And it's not just the individual level. People do at the individual level, use their knowledge, money, power, prestige, and beneficial social connections to get themselves in better spots and attain healthy outcomes. But resources also provide access to general salutary context, the neighborhood you live in, the occupational conditions you experience, the marriage you have to uh, be involved in. Uh, and people in such contexts push for good circumstances for that contextual configuration. My wife, Jo, does it for me. So, you know, in a, in a process we've called collective health agency uh, in this paper that's part of the background of what I'm talking about today. Okay, so, you know, you, you hear that and you wonder, well, that sounds reasonable. And uh, you might want, though, to see whether you there's any way to test its truth value. And our approach so far has been to use the theory to make relatively novel predictions, we think. Predictions that other theories about health inequalities would not make, and then examine empirical evidence as to whether predictions are supported. So the theory points to these flexible resources. So one way to think about testing the theory is can we find situations in which people are unable or less able to effectively use their flexible resources to gain a health advantage? Under uh, such circumstances, we would make the novel prediction that associations between SES and health would be diminished or not ex ex exist at all. So let me take you through a couple of ways we've thought about um, finding variation and whether flexible resources can be used. So we have three types of tests. So the first one is comparing mortality from diseases for which death is more or less preventable. So the SES association should be stronger for diseases that are at least somewhat preventable or, or, or curable. People can use their flexible resources to avoid death. There's something they can do. So if it's Chief Justice John Roberts, me and the guy who sells me coffee, then if there's something we can do about it, Chief Justice John Roberts can get in a better situation than me, me may be in a better situation than the guy who sells me coffee. Uh, and so on. But if we go to, to, if the SES association should be weaker for diseases we know less about preventing or curing. People's flexible resources are relatively useless. We don't know what to do. This is the novel prediction. Um, stress theory wouldn't predict that it would segregate to ones that are uh, more easily preventable. Health selection theory, if, if, you're, if your health is influencing your socioeconomic status, they wouldn't segregate with a disease that happens to be preventable. So they wouldn't, those theories wouldn't make this prediction. It's a, it's a novel one from the point of view of fundamental cause theory. And a second type is similar logic is comparing mortality from a disease before and after a major shift in preventability occurs. So quite a few studies have tried to test the theory this way, before and after cancer screens for colon cancer emerge through time. And, just, and what we see is that an SES uh, association emerges when the preventability rises dramatically. Or before and after knowledge about risk and protective factors emerges such as lung cancer uh, and cigarette smoking. So uh, SES inequalities of disease it will emerge or be pushed to becoming stronger after preventability is enhanced. So do we find that when we go investigate it? And then the third one is a little bit, you know, nerdy maybe, but it's comparing arms of a, a randomized placebo-controlled trial in which the active treatment is actually effective, gets shown to be effective, it helps people, but its appropriate uptake is plausibly influenced by flexible resources. You have to have the time, you, have to have, you don't have the kids screaming, all sorts of other things going on to uptake this uh, beneficial um, thing in the in, in, uh, beneficial intervention. And the novel prediction is that, that an SES association with an outcome will emerge in the active treatment arm, but not in the placebo arm. Higher SES, individual, SES individuals in the placebo arm may be very adept at following the protocol, but it does them no good because they're in the placebo arm of the experiment. So that's been all used 
less frequently, but a few times to test the theory. And so we reviewed the uh, literature recently um, and published it in the annual uh, uh, review of sociology, Sean Kloost and myself. And studies using these th three approaches generally support the predictions. Not every, absolutely every time, but generally. And in that paper, we indicate, you know, the times that it does. And sometimes there's a particular country where it doesn't exactly work out or something like that. Um, but the review also steps back from the theory and tries to think about what things, you know, kind of like we're working with respect to it and why that might be. And other ways of, of, of thinking about the, of the theory and how we should place it in terms of other theories. Um, and so I wanna say a little bit about that. So the theory assumed one of the things we, we, I'm not sure we knew it right when we started thinking about the theory is that the theory assumes that people value health and are generally willing to use their flexible resources to their advantage. So that's usually true. Most of us, you know, we want to be healthy and that's a goal and we use our resources to get, get that, that benefit. But that doesn't always happen. There are some circumstances in which it doesn't, like anti-vaxxers, for example. Or people may value something other than their health more than their health, like being way high on, the, on some prestige hierarchy or power, having power, even though it might be harmful to their health. So think about pro football players, for example. So, and then in my macho masculinity. So there's some times where people value some other things more. And under those conditions, we wouldn't expect our theory to have its intended prediction. Um, and then another thing that we do in, in, in a sort of updating the theory is to think about it as a middle range theory. Um, that's a, was introduced by a very famous sociologist, Robert Merton who said, we don't need grand theories that seek to explain everything, but rather the theories of what he called the middle range that try to make an explanation for a delimited set of facts. And then you need to have these middle range theories join with other theories. And we've realized that fundamental cause doesn't explain every phenomenon. And so it obviously needs to join with other theories. I mean, this could have been said a long time ago, but we make this point pretty strongly in this paper. And there's many other theories that you might need to, to have it join with. But I give one example today of the theory of constrained choices by Burden Riker, because it, it, it indicates that the use of flexible resources, a very important connection to the flexible resources idea, can be constrained at multiple levels and for, more, for some groups more than others. So you can have flexible resources, but if you have constraints imposed upon you from racism or something like that, you can't turn them into health advantages easily. Um, so we, we thought this is another, that's an example of another middle range theory that we need to join with. At the same time, we're claiming that other theories need to join with fundamental cause theory, but because it, it points to processes that have a strong bearing on the generation of health inequalities. So we're positioning an, the theory in that way. So I wanted, you know, that's kind of abstract stuff. And I want to give one example that kind of makes it, you, I think you see it going on. And maybe you've thought all these thoughts already, but here we go. So with COVID, uh, it's a new disease. So we might've asked, will health inequalities be expressed as COVID spreads through the population? It would have to be so. In fact, the virus doesn't care if you're rich or poor, black, white or brown, it's agnostic to those things. But fundamental cause uh, can be a lens for understanding what might happen when a virus agnostic to it might be, uh, affect meets social inequality. And so let's think a little bit about this. In the early stages of the epidemic, people weren't aware that they were being infect infected. Now I think of our three types of tests. So at that point, could they use their flexible reload? resources? No, they didn't realize it'd come into their area. It's just there. And that virus can go after whoever it wants. It doesn't have to be poor people or, or, or marginalized people. So could people who had high levels of flexible resources use it at that time to avoid it? No, not at first. Given that it spread internationally in this early period, who's most likely to be infected first? So just think that thought for yourself. And then we'll well, international world travelers, people who take cruises, 
people who go to ski resorts where all sorts of international travelers show up and business elites. And we saw early outbreaks in those kinds of circumstances. And here's Italy and Spain where the uh, COVID epidemic you know, hit early on. And what you see in these, these two uh, scatter plots is on the, on the x-axis, you see the GDP of the area of Spain and the areas of Italy, like their states. Um, uh, uh, so on the right-hand side of the richer places, on the left-hand side of the poorer places, and you can just look at those uh, dots, which are each state, and see that the richer you are, the more deaths you have. So early on, it whammy the rich. And then will fundamental cause processes shift this epidemic? Well, who cannot, this is the obvious stuff, who, to all of us now, who can't social distance, people in essential jobs, who lives a tight living quarter, who gets grocery deliveries and who delivers them, who can retreat to weekend homes, whose hospital has the ventilators, who gets the short supply of effective treat, uh, treatments, who got first access to the vaccines. People at higher level SES can use flexible resources to protect themselves and, and then the shape of the pandemic should change. And so to investigate this, this is the same Sean Clouston's picture I just showed you a minute ago. And I, this is kind of hit, what he does so well is visualize things and, 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 and have a quantitative assessment of them. Here, here this is about the, the wealth of the counties uh, in the United States. And there's some 3000 something counties in the United States. And on the picture on the left-hand side, we start, time starts when the first case was identified in the United States. And then what we're asking is which counties, um, how long does it take for a county to get their first case? And will it happen more rapidly in high SES or in low SES counties? And what you see there at the left-hand side is that it's much shorter time to when a high SES county gets its first uh, case than a low SES county. But then on the right-hand side, what you see in that slide is this is now, for after a county gets its first case, what happens to the subsequent incidents in those counties? And you see there that the rate goes up much faster in low SES counties. So you're just seeing in front of yourselves this kind of shifting and how the possibility that flexible resources and, and, and the, the, the ability of people with flexible resources to protect themselves shapes, shapes the ep epidemic. And just to bring it right home, here's uh, the, the California counties, cases per 100,000 uh, by county, by the percent minority population in those counties. And it's, you know, at lockdown in, in March of 2020, then in May 2020, then January 2021, and then yesterday I did it for January 2022. And what you see there is if, right at the beginning, it, it's agnostic to where it's hitting it, with respect to the percent minority in the area. But over time, it, do, it, it gets shaped in that way. So it's pretty strongly related. So all of you knew that this epidemic uh, didn't go through um, our population in an equal way, but this is using the uh, fundamental cause le uh, lens to kind of think about it. Okay, done with that. So, so far, introduction of this fundamental cause idea, the centrality of flexible resources and generating health inequalities, quickly reviewed taking stock of the theory. And, um, but now what I'd like to do is expand a bit to consider stigma and racial stigmatization. So could stigma be a fundamental cause? Of, um, uh, uh, and so we could ask ourselves, do stigmatized groups experience health inequalities across multiple health outcomes through multiple replaceable mechanisms? Yes, you know, pretty much most often at, at, at least. And what would lead to the replacement of mechanisms uh, in this instance? What would that diabolical magic be that I mentioned earlier? We can't use that, so what is it? In order to think of stigma as a fundamental cause, we would have to specify what that was. What is the mechanism generator? So can we do that? So first, let me just say, just briefly, the, the way I, Joe and I, Phelan and I, whose picture you see there 
think about uh, st stigma just for a second. Um, and then we'll get on to thinking about it as a possible fundamental cause. So we have these six things that we think should be present if you wanna call something stigmatized. There's all sorts of things that could be stigmatized. What's the essence that you wanna have be there if you're gonna call something stigmatized? And so the first is people label and distinguish human differences. There are all sorts of human differences, millions of uh, human differences in, the, in, what, what, in all of you that are here today. But which ones get plucked out for social salience? That's a, a social accomplishment. And then you make a designation and then labeled persons are linked to undesirable characteristics, to unwarranted ne negative stereotypes. So, you know, I've been in a psychiatric hospital, you think I'm dangerous. Then labeled persons are viewed as an outgroup, as them, not us, there's a separation in that way. And then people experience emotional reactions to labeled people fear, repulsion, disgust, or labeled people may feel emotions of shame, embarrassment, or humiliation. And then labeled persons experience being put down in social hierarchies and discriminated against. But the, I wanted to say those things, but the real thing I wanted to get to is the sixth one, that it's dependent on power. These things take power to pull off. So let's just think about that for a moment. Stigma requires power. It takes power to decide which characteristic to label and make salient. It's kind of like taken for granted. It just happens, boom, boom. We don't even think about it, but there is that it, it's something, it didn't come down from a tablet from the mountain. It's something that human beings do. And then you have to have the power to construct the stereotypes and make them stick. And who gets to do that? That's a kind of power. Power to broadly accomplish the separation of groups into us and them. That separation takes a power, power to exclude from desirable jobs, housing and educational opportunities. You have to have access to those things and say, no, you don't get them. Uh, and then people are doing these things, exercising power in these ways. It follows that they do so to achieve an end they desire. So what could that be? What do people get from stigmatizing others? So here I've got Joe's picture in a big frame because it's really her set of ideas. So it, uh, three things we're, we're gonna emphasize right now, exploitation and domination, or, or more pithily put it, keeping people down, norm enforcement, keeping people within normative bounds, or disease, disease avoidance, keeping people away from you. And I'll say a little bit more about each one of those and give an iconic example. So ex exploitation and domination, keeping people down, racism and the stigmatization of African-Americans to justify slavery. So you can exploit them. It justifies the exploitation. They're lesser than, they're down below you. Not really human as Goffman used to say. That, so that, that kind of stuff um, allows their, 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 um, their, their, their exploitation or the stigmatization of American Indians to facilitate the irrigation of their lands. So that, and then a second thing you can get by stigmatizing others is keeping people in. Stigma is deployed to punish people who violate social norms and to serve as an example to all others that they shouldn't do. So the scarlet letter. We're gonna slam that A on you for adulterer. We wanna keep you from expressing your sexual feelings in this way. We wanna keep you within bounds. And we want that A on you so everybody else will know that if they do it, they'll be shamed as well. So I think about that as uh, stigma seeks to keep people in, in terms of gay marriage bans. No, you can't do that. You must do man and woman. So, uh, and then disease avoidance, keeping people away. Stigma is used to keep people away, perhaps an evolutionary developed aversion to contagious disease and as indicated by skin lesions, but also erratic behavior, strange gait. Stigma can be used to ext extrude and exclude if that's what stigmatizers desire. So the, the main thing we're getting from this is stigma does something for people. Stigma can be a valued tool to achieve desired ends of keeping people down in or away. And if the motivation to stigmatize endures, we might expect stigmatizers to find alternate ways to achieve uh, desired ends. If one way of achieving those ends is blocked, they find another one. And so this is the rationale for the mechanism replacement aspect of fundamental cause theory. How we can see it is a real project that people engage in and not just 
diabolical magic. They're going to replace those mechanisms because they want to, because they're getting something they want from it. But are there uh, replaceable mechanisms that people can harness to achieve the ends they desire? So, you know, if you block the only mechanisms that's there, then, then it's done. So you have to have replaceable mechanisms. So in stigma, are there multiple replaceable mechanisms? Well, I call to the stigma domain mechanism heaven. You just think about it. There's all sorts of ways to make people feel uncomfortable and unwanted, like they don't belong where they are. All sorts of policies that can be enacted that disadvantage or signal that someone is not a person of worth or on par with others. It's just a massive multiplicity of possibilities that people can use to achieve, to achieve these ends. So there are replaceable mechanisms. So we have strong enduring motivations to keep people down in their array. To the extent those exist, there's one thing that would be needed to think about stigma as a fundamental cause, a flexible replaceable mechanisms to achieve desired ends. And then power differences can, can be expressed in stigma components of labeling, stereotyping, separating status loss and, and discrimination. So that the ingredients are there. And again, I'll just give one example of thinking about this. And I take it from um, Michelle Alexander's thinking. And we'll think, we'll think about how the racial stigmatization of African-Americans in the United States. And we think about three historical periods over on the left-hand side, we're thinking of the period of slavery and at the top, we have the racist, racial, uh, racist motivation, exploitation, and domination. Uh, and uh, then the strong arrow is through slavery. That, that mechanism is really strong initially. Maybe there was some Jim Crow stuff back in that era as well. And that leads to discrimination, segregation, restricted freedom, stress, downward SES placement, which leads to health inequality for the group. The second period, we end slavery. And then the response is the massive construction of Jim Crow um, and, and, it, and its variants in the, in, in the northern part of the country at, at, that becomes the stronger, newer mechanism. And then finally, uh, Michelle Alexander's theme about uh, mass incarceration as uh, the new Jim Crow. We block Jim Crow to, to some extent in the third period, but then there's a new mechanism. So this is, the, this is the reasoning here. With respect to stigma, this is a set of ideas, and this is consistent with that idea. We haven't fully tested it as much as we have with SES and health. And so, you know, but this is the reasoning. This is the rationale for why we might think about it as a fundamental cause. And then I, it's kind of obvious from what I just said, but I really wanted to underscore it. It, this happens through the social determinants of health, discrimination, segregation, restrictive freedom, stress, downward placement. This is how stigma achieves this. Uh, resources are reduced, exclusion is enacted, and it's UCLA, Lon Myers from uh, UCLA is a term of minority stress. It's something that happens to groups that are in, uh, to, to people in the minority group that people in the majority group don't experience or the oppressors don't experience. So with minority stress, a stress is added, a stress that exists only because of a stigmatized status. All right, so that was sort of part two. And now I wanna to go to part three and it's something else I've been thinking about. It's got me all animated and upset. <laughs> and so I'll try to express to you uh, exactly what it is. So um, you will have noticed that in the foregoing an emphasis on the behaviors of advantage groups in creating health inequalities. So people use their flexible resources. Um, you know, you can think about it as opportunity hoarding and that kind of thing. So the focus is on the people at the top with respect to the use of flexible resources. And of course, then with move to, to, to stigma and racism, it's the keeping people down in a way that we're seeing um, and it's focusing on the stigmatizers who are engaging these processes, and animating them and replacing the mechanisms. Um, so um, well, I wanna see whether this lens has been applied in population health research. 
Now, the story is that I got together with my colleague here, uh, Juanita Garcia. I'll show you her, her picture in a moment. And we thought that, yeah, that's going on, that, that we're not getting enough focus in um, the current literature on the actions of the advantaged, uh, that it basically doesn't exist. So we wrote a paper about that, an essay about it, and claimed it to be true without presenting a whole bunch of evidence. And we got smashed by the, the critics. They didn't believe us. And they asked us to go get some evidence. So we just decided, well, OK, we'll do that. We think this is going on, but we're not sure, or at least our colleagues aren't sure. So let's see what we find. Um, and the idea here is there's a shift in focus from those who prove what we have in the population health literature is a shift in focus from those who produce the inequality to those who are disadvantaged by the inequality. It's sort of what's wrong with them? What's going wrong in that community? You know, that, that's where the problem is. Let's go fix that. What can we do to help them if we put a little bit of a liberal tinge into it? We have to help them. Now, maybe we do. I'm not saying that that's not part of the problem, but the focus gets shifted over there and away from anything that the advantage groups might be doing. We call this shifting a diversion. That was why it's in the title of the paper I just showed you. So we needed some evidence. We thought, well, we're going to go to the steps of the research project process and see what we find. So grants would be the starting point. You know, you get grants and you do the grant and that produces the canon of literature. Secondary data sets are huge, the big national ones, the ones we invest tons of money in, recurring uh, longitudinal studies or re recurring cross-sectional studies. Um, so that's another thing because that's where people go to see what's happening to the trends and by race and by socioeconomic status. Do we have any focus on the advantage in there? And then we go to the research literature and policy priorities. Uh, I'll take a couple minutes on this. I'll try to go through this fast because I want to hear from you. But so if we went to grants and we went to the, uh, to the NIH, it has this thing called the reporter. And we looked at 349 grants. Um, and we asked, could we find a focus on behaviors of advantage groups in creating health inequalities? Or would we find an emphasis on the traits, behaviors, circumstances of people downwardly located and socioeconomic and racial hierarchies? And what we found in these grants is none of the grants, that's zero. Um, had a focus on uh, something that advantage groups were doing, hoarding resources or anything like that. Remarkably, only 31 of these 340 grants health, uh, on health disparities also referred to discrimination. Very few to segregation or structural racism. The vast majority of the grants focused on behaviors, traits, or community contexts of marginalized groups. In secondary data sets, we uh, selected large nationally represented studies that focused on health and make uh, the collected data publicly available. And then, um, yeah, and I said the other things. None of these studies had a theme focus on health inequality generating actions of advantaged people. None of the seven major studies we reviewed included a measure of racial and ethnic discrimination as a core set of questions. A lot of them had it, but it was in some leave behind or something like that. Uh, neither, neither did any of the studies include a measure of microaggressions, ethnic pride, racial socialization, or implicit bias. They have all sorts of other things um, about health behaviors, biomarkers, genetic assessments, whether you want to buff up, all sorts of things, but not that much on, on the consequences of what advantage groups might be doing to people, uh, to, to other people in terms of, of, of harming them. Uh, and then we looked at the uh, 324 articles from AJPH, the Journal of Health and Social Behavior and Social uh, Science and Medicine Population Health. We looked at 324 articles and it's only seven, 2.2% focused directly on the role that advantage groups play in generating health inequalities. We found that racism was mentioned in 10.8% of them. And these are about health inequalities institutionalized racism in only 2.8. Uh, of the articles reviewed, 4.9% included a measure of interpersonal discrimination. That blows my mind. You know, what are they doing? Anyway, for characteristics of the disadvantaged, health, health, health behaviors were most common uh, uh, 
be included 44%, followed by neighborhood or contextual conditions, biomarkers, attitudes, and genetic factors. So let me finally take you to, to policy and healthy people 2030's goal of uh, uh, reducing health disparities, eliminate health disparities, achieve health equity, and attain health literacy to improve the health and uh, well being of all. This is much the same goal as health pe Healthy People 2000, 2010, 2020. So we've been saying this a long time, we're gonna get rid of it. The emphasis in these, uh, these documents is focused on the creation of healthy lifestyles in the American people and the call for action to reduce health disparities emphasizes changing such behaviors. So it's focused on the people who are the recipients of the, the, the poorer health. Uh, the, the approach to addressing health inequalities is portrayed in the following uh, graphic. So you've probably seen something like this, but now you, you have this diversions lens, I hope, a little bit. Let's look at it from that perspective for a second. So what we see in this in infographic, it comes from the CDC, is you see the apple of good health up there at the top. And you see two men, it looks like men to me, um, uh, reaching up to get the apple. And one of them's tall and can reach up there and get it without any help. But the other poor, smaller guy needs the benefits of the programs, which are those boxes. They can lift, lift that person up to get the best help. And the focus is down at the bottom, all the uh, minority ethnic groups, uh, people with living racial and ethnic minority groups, black and Hispanic children, low income populations and Alaska natives. These are, that, these are the where the focus is. And what we need are these boxes with helping them with their behaviors to reach the apple uh, of good health. So now you've got this diversions lens on it. And so how would I want to reconstruct this picture? And what really infuriates me about it? Well, the most prominent thing that infuriates me about it is that the people are actually different, portrayed as having different sizes. It's natural, one's bigger than the other. Instead of having them be the same size and the guy on the left having the boxes, which are advantages that they get with their flexible resources and so on. And he's got the boxes, he can get up there and get it. And not only does he have the boxes, he's got a gate around it, a wall and police there too. Uh, 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 and that would be a portrayal of what I think we need more of. Now, it's not that we don't need the boxes that we see in this picture. It does good to do those things uh, with respect to health behaviors, but it's not a full accounting of the situation that we confront if we don't have also an emphasis on the inequality generating behaviors of more advantaged groups. So here's to sum up. We had a review and update on fundamental cause. We considered extension to stigma and racial stigmatization. We noticed fundamental causes focus on the actions of those propitiously situated in racial and socioeconomic hierarchies and creating health inequalities. We considered some evidence on whether current health research focuses on the inequality generation processes that advantaged groups participate in, and we concluded mainly no. And then the conclusion from this, and this is what we, you know, this is what I think we really need to figure out how to do, is telling the full story of the origins of health inequalities needs an additional consideration of the health inequality generating actions of advantage groups. I hope I did stir you up a little bit. I'm done. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Bruce. Would you be, would you mind going back to that slide because there's so much in it? And I don't know if everyone got a chance to, to read all of it. And so on the note of this slide, <laughs> I wanna welcome anyone who would like to speak directly or to type into the chat box questions that you have. Um, this was uh, just typically brilliant. <laughs> Bruce, and I, I really look forward to your circulating the new and revised health equity poster from the CDC that you'll be creating. <laughs> I'm sure that will stir up a lot of people. Um, while people are kind of collecting their thoughts, I wanted to ask a question as somebody who does a lot of work on 
racial inequality in health and specifically the drivers? What are the mechanisms driving racial inequalities, the, the oppressions, as you very accurately put it? And what I want to know is, and, and uh, as you know, some uh, a big part of my own work has been shifting the lens to look at whiteness as opposed to black or brownness and how whiteness creates these inequalities, which you took on head on in this presentation. I wanted to ask about um, that thread in connection with stigma. I bet you get this question often about whether racial oppression is exactly the same as the other forms, whether it's stigma, actually a form of stigma, and whether there's anything different um, between racial oppression and the, the forms of stigma that you described that don't involve race, at least not explicitly. Uh, my, my guess is that you do get that question with your current work on stigma as a fundamental cause. Yeah, that's a that's a fabulous thing to, to think about. And um, in some ways, you know, you and I should have a 10 hour discussion about this. Um, but but what I'll say about it, and I'm not it won't hit the nail on the head at all. But what I'll say about this is really every stigmatized circumstance that I would put in the pool of things that are, are stigmatized is really complete is different in in, in major ways. And so it's kind of funny that we talk about them in, in one bucket of, of, of stigma because they are so different. So it's other concepts in the stigma area about why, how they're different. Uh, and so those are needed. But I would, when I think about, I, so I would think about uh, racial oppression as having you know, all sorts of different roots um, and, and, um, of its origins. And, uh, and I've, I've, I'm getting educated about this stuff, but in, 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 and some of you are from an anthropological bent, and I hope I don't say anything dumb in this area, but um, the, the idea of the origins of racial categories and colonialism and all of that background um, and what that brings to the current situation, that's different than you know, any of the other stigmatizing circumstances I might talk about. Um, I think it's useful to think about them in the, in the, also in the same way, but also how different they, each one is. So, because there are, there are, I think, some similarities. And I know this is a bit of a difference between anthropology and sociology. Um, I learned this from one of our colleagues who, who, who told me that anthropologists like to complicate things. And sociologists, and you sort of saw it in my behavior just now, like to make, try to make generalizations. So fundamental cause is trying to make some generalizations and st the stigma theme is trying to make some generalizations across things. And I think both activities are so important. Um, uh, but I would say uh, that's too long of an answer without enough substance to answering your, your, your quest or responding to your uh, question or comment. So I think it's a really important to think about each one of them as different, and I would, you know, as well as thinking about what similarities are between them. Thank you. Really appreciate that answer. And I think embedded in what you said, I heard a really useful uh, distinction, which is that racial oppression is perhaps a set of stigmas. You know, it's it's more like a system that has a set of different stigmas built into it, um, not a single form of stigma or mechanism, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I'd love to have that, that conversation. <laughs> and I, there's another question in the chat. By the way, anyone who feels up to asking their question directly, feel free to do the hand raise um, icon or to raise your hand in the screen and we'll we'll try to track, I think, Ethel and Ben um, us being our very talented senior uh, senior research theme um, administrator and Ben um, also Ben Francis being a really important support to the seminar. Uh, so if you could help me monitor, but the question that is in the chat is, are there noticeable differences in fundamental cause theory contexts, and I think implied here also findings, 
when you look at other developed nations, so for example, US versus Norway with the latter having more socialized social care. Oh, that's, I get that question quite a bit too, because, uh, and there's two things about it. First is you, when you think about the healthcare systems, they're, you, you know, they're radically different and they're more equal um, in some European countries and they're, how they get distri distributed to people. So would you think that you you find a, a diminishing of the of the connection with SES and health, and one of the interesting things is, and I had it in my slides, is that tests of fundamental cause theory have been done across uh, 19 settings in in Europe by a guy named Johann Machenbach, and um, and what he what he looks at is whether or not you know the uh, diseases that are more preventable have stronger SES associations than ones that are less across those 19 countries. And basically he finds that you, you get that fundamental cause theory prediction is supported in most of the countries, not all. Uh, so he says it's in, in the conclusion of his art is mainly supported when you go to uh, like Western European countries. Um, so it seems to come up there as well. And one of the reasons that it might is that the, that the social determinants of health um, are impactful irrespective of the, the medical system. And those operate in these countries uh, as well. And so that, that, that would be a reason why the sort of more equally distributed healthcare um, doesn't make the association evaporate between SES and, and health mortality. Uh, thanks for that question. Thank you. And there are two more questions in the chat that I think um, are running along similar lines. So in the interest of time, maybe I'll give you both of them. Okay. Um, okay. This one is, could you comment on how you envision operationalizing the implications of this work on propitious positioning and hierarchies? public health interventions. And then the, se the second question is, I realize we still need to study the advantage group actions more first to understand them better, but would love to hear if you thought about what potential interventions could be done in advantaged groups to even the playing field, like the boxes in the CDC diagram under the disadvantaged groups, lowering the ground that the advantage groups stand on and the feasibility of this. Yeah, so, uh... Uh, let, let me start with the, the, the last one first, and then you can remind me a little bit of the first one. So I think there, the, the way I think about that, and I don't have any, you know, magic uh, wander ball, ball to, crystal ball to see the truth then, but I think that we're engaged in this action all the time. Um, and it's generally uh, favoring the, our policies and so on, are generally favoring um, uh, people who are in more of advantaged circumstances because they're out using their power to make sure that it happens. So, I mean, we're, had, we're seeing these kinds of things like, for example, in California with respect to housing and zoning and, you know, people can't afford housing, but their zoning laws are single family housing. So those, you can change those kinds of things. Now it's not within, public health necessarily to do that. But if we, if we don't tell this full story, people won't see that this also involves health. We have to see that there's health in all policies and that when we construct policies that are, are, are presuming advantage for advantage group and disadvantage for disadvantage groups, we're creating the circumstances that lead to health consequences. So it might take, if we're in public health, it might take us out of our comfort zone of the kinds of things we can think, think we can do, do uh, in that uh, package of things that we usually think about. Um, uh, but we, we'd have to think more towards the policies. That's the way I would think about it. And I think some kind of like calling them out could be okay. You know, um, for example, hoarding of, uh, of hospital rooms by rich people, by their donations and stuff. I don't think it would be bad to have that be more brought out and, 
and showing the inequality and showing it in a scientific, social scientific way. I think that, that, that could be useful as well. And then the first chat question was, just remind me the theme and I'll get it. Uh, oh, sure. And I just want to signal there's one more question. Hopefully we'll have time. Uh, so the other question was, could you comment on how you envision operationalizing the implications of this work on propitious positioning and hierarchies, public health interventions? Oh, those were kind of connected. Yeah. I think. So you, you may want to go to the next question unless you wanted okay. to add to that. All right. If the person who asked that one comes to the reception, they can ask me there. <laughs> no, I mean the first one. So I have. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Right. The next question is, um, I think in a U.S. context, at least one could make a case that racism and racial stigmatization is more fundamental than socioeconomic stratification. Having extended your theory into this area, would you agree? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, in a way, I, I, uh, sort of uh, Joe led a paper in thinking about racism as a fundamental cause. And it kind of made the, the point that I think the questioners making that racism uh, affects socioeconomic status in a kind of a fundamental cause relationship. So that, you know, that the repeating the, the mechanism, uh, replacing the mechanisms linking uh, race and ra via racism to socioeconomic status. And then socioeconomic status is also a fundamental cause of health. And then racism is an independent fundamental cause of, of, health, of health. So if you frame it that way, I, I'd say, I would, th I would think that way. Now I know that we could have somebody who came from a Marxist orientation and they would say perhaps that the Marxism, <laughs> the, the, the class lies behind the racism. So that thought's worth, worth having as well. Um, uh, or it's, it's an interesting thing thing to think about and it's an interesting tension. But the way we portray it is like the, the questioner, um, um, I think, posed it. Thank you. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a very long debate um, around Marxist theory and race. Yeah. <laughs> With the, uh, yeah, many scholars of um, racism taking a different yeah. interpretation. But just to close out, we have a comment here. Wouldn't for-profit healthcare and racialized capitalism be fundamental causes? Do you want to give us a parting thought on that? <laughs> yeah, well, this is another thing about the, the, our theory. Um, it, we're trying to, we were trying to explain what it is that happens when uh, people are in action to reproduce the associations. So these flexible resources are important because that's what people are using um, in the, to, to get, gain a health advantage. So we, we really emphasize that. But it's important as I think the questioner is pointing out that you know, something, those don't just get dropped down and you got them, they come from other places. And the study of that is critically important to understanding the whole flow through to the consequences. And so there's, you know, people have been talking and wanting to build it out farther to say what, what creates, and of course, this happens in the social sciences all, all along, what creates the, the distribution of flexible resources or the power to stigmatize others. So something lies prior to and creates those things. But what the, we were focused on, what reproduces the association, that's why that's so strongly emphasized, but I think the point is a really good one. Thank you. All right, well, I see we're already over time, but this has been such a fantastic conversation. And um, I don't know, Bruce, if you can see the enthusiastic uh, chat, <laughs> string of chat comments. Um, thanks again for joining us. You've really put us on the right track for 2022, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, too. Thank I'll you. Remember that forever. <laughs>